This video is made possible by our sponsors, AJA. We'd like to thank AJA for all their support and tell you to go to AJA.com for all your production and post-production needs. I'm Josh Apter from Filmmaker U, sitting in for the convalescing Gordon Burkell. Uh, Filmmaker U, we create uh, courses by film professionals for film professionals to understand the art and the uh, technique of, of film editing, color correction, um, sound design, documentary, you name it. Um, you can find us on Instagram at Filmmaker U and go to filmmakeru.com for more information. Um, every week we do an interview with a film professional this week. Um, Jason Oldak, I hope I'm not mispronouncing. I should have asked your name and for, I got it right. Let me just- You got it right. Yeah. All right. Um, uh, and, and we're going to talk about your uh, your career, how you got started, and then um, specifically lessons in chemistry streaming on Apple TV Plus, which as reluctant as I was to join because I feel like I give Apple all my money anyway, um, I did plunk down for this and it was well worth it. So welcome to uh, the, the talk today and let us know a little bit about who you are, how you got started and what you're up to. Uh, well, first off, thank you for having me here. Um, I am uh, from New York City. Uh, I was an artist. I am an artist, but I was a fine artist before I was a cinematographer. Um, and I went to uh, the Performing Arts High School originally. My mom is an artist. And I really didn't think that this is where I would be then in terms of the path, career path. Um, I got into a school called Cooper Union in New York, which is an art school, but it is uh, the type of art school that doesn't require you to have a major. So you, they want you as an artist to explore all kinds of different art and see what interests you. And then as you get closer to the end of your four years to kind of, you know, have a focus, have a thesis, et cetera. Uh, in about my second or third year, I took an experimental film course, which was very much that most of the kids in my class were, you know, scribbling on the negative, you know, doing all kinds of things. And I was probably one of the few that was actually making narrative films. Now I was doing everything uh, and which was crazy thinking back to what I do now and, you know, how was I doing all that stuff? But um, I was trying to make stories. Um, uh, and then I kind of still had a focus in painting <laughs> graphic design, and I left Cooper Union as a graphic designer uh, and worked in that field for about two years. But while I was doing that, I, number one, didn't want to be behind a computer for my entire career. Uh, and I was continually interested in film, uh, but I just didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, there was, there's a museum in New York called the Museum of Moving Image. And sure. in uh, 2005 or six, there was a master seminar with a bunch of really um, famous cinematographers. Gordon Willis was there, Conrad Hall, a uh, couple other guys. Um, and I went not really knowing, I just went just to kind of listen to these guys. Uh, and as they all started to speak about their careers and what they did leading up to their careers, they talked about how they were painters and photographers uh, and I thought to myself, well, oh, well, that's what I do right now. You know, maybe the art of cinematography is something that I can look into and maybe that's something I can do uh, as a filmmaker. So I started to do a little more research and uh, it seemed like the right fit. Um, so I applied to a bunch of film schools. Luckily, I got into the one that I think was exactly where I should have gone, which was AFI. Uh, and I went there in 2003. And I learned so much because I really, I had slight film background. I did motion graphics in graphic design. Uh, and Bill Dill, who was running the program at the time, I think he kind of took a gamble on me. You know, I didn't have as much uh, film making history like some of the other guys that were in my class. But uh, uh, I, I got in and I learned so much in two years. And then I started working. and you know, just going up the ladder from there. No, oh, that's great. I, um, I, I, AFI, you know, they take a gamble, but it, if it's, if it's how I remember, I have a close friend who went through the producing, uh, track it, that, uh, only a certain percentage of students are asked back for the, 
for a second year. Right. So, uh, you know, I guess they're hedging their bets to some degree. But um, yeah, my, my friend Tammy Teal went through their program, probably not that far off from the time that you did, and came to New York to shoot a film that won an Academy Award, like, a, like uh, ultimately. And so like, yeah, I mean, it, it was crazy to me because I helped, I was here and I was at NYU and I was like, sure, I'll, I'll help do sound. And it came in with this giant production and it was like, you know, she, she really, you know, had it down. It's an amazing program. I mean, hands down, it's, uh, we've yeah, had I students think, from them. Another <laughs> thing that I, that I just want to say, because I think this is some of our audiences, you know, aspiring filmmakers, right. And, uh, educational. I mean, what I think is so no, number one, what I think is so great about AFI is that it's two years you work with other disciplines immediately you make a ton of work and then you go into the industry instead of just like kind of four years you make a thesis film are you done yet you continue like it's intensive but you learn a lot and then you start working another thing that i think is really important is getting an education in something else first and then doing graduate school filmmaking because um you know, especially as a director or a writer, uh, but even as a cinematographer, you know, you're telling stories and you're experiencing life. And I think if you have an education in other things, uh, even if you're like a sociology major and then you decide I want to be a director, you know, you, you have an understanding of something else. You have something to talk about, you know, mm -hmm. um, that's my that's my take on film school. I think what attracted me to color correction was the fact that we were like the next stage of cinematography. And the creative side was huge, trying to understand what was wrong with an image, how to balance it, trying to understand how to let the tools do what you want them to do. Where else can the technology go? What else can we do? I'm very interested in trying to mold the image and create the best look possible. And whatever tools are out there, you want to try and latch onto them. I'm Eric Whip, and this is my course on color correction. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, Manhattan Edit Workshop is is part of the you know the 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 body behind Filmmaker U, and a lot of students in our film editing program come from a music background, yeah. and their sense of rhythm is different than someone who doesn't, or uh, someone who's an an actor who wants to get more behind the camera and you know create their own material. Um, they have a, 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 an eye for performance that some someone else might not have. Um, they're not completely outside the, the discipline of filmmaking, but they're not, you know, someone who turn, becomes an editor may have done a number of other things prior to that informs their experience as, as an editor or in your case, a cinematographer too. Um, so how was it when you, you know, you got out of, out of AFI and you were immediately handed a Panavision camera, $100 million feature film, go crazy. So being that that's probably not what happened, how the trajectory from school to, you know, having a really neat understanding of what you're doing and working professionally, what was that like? Well, first of all, I right before I graduated, I, I went into, I'm sure he won't mind me saying this, I went into, Stephen Lighthill was the head of the department in second year at AFI and I went into his office and we were talking about just, you know, the future and whatnot. And I said, uh, I said, Stephen, so what, what's next? <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> and he was, he kind of like shook his shoulders. Like, he's like, I, uh, he's like, everyone has their own path. Everyone has their own story. I, whatever I did, you know, everyone's going to find their own way um you know bill would say shoot everything and anything i, I didn't shoot everything mm -hmm. and maybe that was right wrong you know there were certain projects especially when you're younger that it's like oh, so i want to get mm -hmm. involved in that um what i did do which was different i didn't you know what some students had that i didn't have they went to undergrad so they had a connection to some directors immediately after they left school i had director friends in afi but they were just getting started like i was so I worked in a lot of different things. I mean, I worked as an electrician for a few years, you know, my it, always trying to operate. I feel like a camera operator, if you want to be a DP and you can't immediately be a DP, try and be a camera operator as best you can, because you are right next to the cinematographer and you mm -hmm. are watching what they're doing right and wrong and learning. 
and you hear the discussions with the director and the DP. Sometimes the director talks to you. It's a, a, a very educational position, I think, on set if you want to become that. And I did that a lot, thankfully, to a lot of my friends that you know I had worked with at AFI who were getting jobs and they were like, hey, do you want to come operate on this? Mm -hmm. um, and so I was getting experience in doing that. And then whenever I could, I would shoot, uh, you know, small projects. Um, you know, I did a couple of features. Uh, I did one soon after school with somebody from AFI, but, you know, it's kind of didn't go to the places we wanted it to. Mm -hmm. But I would say that my my break, if you want to call it that, was my friend John Golisarian. He had some success in his career early on, and he was hired on a show called Casual, which was on Hulu. Um, Helen Estabrook, Jason Reitman, um, Sandra Lehman, they were all behind it. And he brought me in immediately as his A camera operator. And I worked on that show for two seasons. And then in the third season, he uh, needed to leave. And he expressed to the producers, I think you should hire Jason to shoot it. And I thank every one of them because they took a gamble on me. You know, they, I wasn't, I was doing like B unit, second unit stuff for them, but you know, they didn't truly know what I was going to do as a cinematographer. And uh, I think I kicked ass. <laughs> so uh, I did the next two seasons and then the show ended. Right. Um, but that was kind of the beginning of sort of my foray into a lot of this other television that I have on my resume. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm really thankful that show. I'm very proud of that show to this day. I think it's a great show if you haven't seen it. Um, but yeah, that's where it kind of started. I think mm -hmm. like as you're working through these smaller projects, that was the big lead. Right. For me. And it's sort of like, it, you know, you can't call it a lucky break because you're creating your own luck. You're, you're putting yourself in a position. You're taking advantage of a situation to get close to an opportunity when an opportunity presents itself. And someone gives you a chance, you grab it, and you know, you, you, it, I think it's it's a sort of people say like it's part luck, it's part skill, it's a little combination of everything. Uh, yeah. um, but people who are ready for luck often get the lucky break that they're you know you sort of create your you own. Have to be, you have to be um, in, a little bit of you have to be in the right place at the right time. But I think you just have mm -hmm. to have perseverance. You have to be. You have to connect with people, you know, and, um, uh, you know, if you get that opportunity, your talent will show through, you know, um, I think. I mean, yours certainly has, um, but uh, I'm sure there are plenty of people who, you know, they jump in and do a big old belly flop into the pool and it's, you know, but it can also be a learning experience that isn't career ending. It's just, I know what not to do. Um, you know, and uh, you're given other opportunities and, you know, that's, you know, I think anything, any experience can be a learning experience if you look at it the right way. Um, totally, Josh. I mean, there are projects on my resume where if I was to talk about them, maybe like, why did I do that? No, I know exactly why I did that because I learned this, this, this and this mm -hmm. to not do that on this other job, you know, I mean, and that goes for even stuff I did before filmmaking, you know, I mean, everything kind of if you're taking advantage of what you're doing, your rights and your wrongs, you know, you're learning from your process, you know? Um, yeah. I think that, you know, I eventually we'll talk about lessons in chemistry. I think that what I did on this show is a culmination of so much learning that I've done in the last 20 years, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I hope I can, you know, continues to go for all these other projects. And yeah, no, it's great. Um, yeah. I, I, we can start talking about that. I think it's also, worth noting that as a, as a as a human being learning through these experiences you know part of being certainly i know as an editor i'm sure as a cinematographer part of it is 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 a personality type it's a you're a confidant you're a supporter you're challenging ideas to get the best idea like there are things about the the, the work and the and, and the relationships that Sure, it's in service of the of the art and the job you do, but there's skills that you develop as a as person just by living, having relationships with people. That's you know? a really good point, um, because what a lot of the work that I was doing before I got into filmmaking was um, singular. You know, a painter works by themselves, graphic designer sometimes works with a team, but works by themselves. 
um, you know, everything that I do now is with a team, is with collaboration, is with running a crew. Um, and personality is very important in this industry. Um, you know, in terms of how you deal with producers, how you collaborate with directors, and then how you manage a team. You know, you have mm -hmm. to be able to to talk about your vision, be open to idea. I mean, there's so much to it. It's, but um, I think that I um, have managed that quite well. Um, mm -hmm. That's my cruise, but <laughs> I think oh, I did I, ask. I have a whole list here. Uh, never work with again. <laughs> um, no, just um, but it is. I described it as a um, you're like the ringleader of the circus in yep. a way because everyone out there, all the acts, right, all the different people have, bring skill to it. You just let them bring their strengths to their discipline, and you're keeping it organized, keeping the best work going, keeping the you know the relationships. You kind of have to keep it humming. Um, I mean, you're you're also in the center of a very large part of it. So, um, you know, in the, and, and it, not to, I mean, look, we can go for hours because I do think it all relates to um, lessons in chemistry because A, I want to know how that, how you got the job. Uh, so there's a two-parter. It, it leads into, this is an ultimate collaboration. There were two DPs, five editors, a number of directors. Um, I know a series doesn't necessarily work the way a film works where it's, one editor, one cinematographer, one director, like that core group of people. Sometimes it is. Uh, we've talked to people in, in you know, on, on you know, uh, prestige TV shows, if that's what you call it, who would say I had one, one team the whole, the whole time, and and I love that. And other people saying, this show is telling us what to do, and if they, if you listen and if you're collaborating, probably you you understand, and it's a shared vision. But first, how did you how did you get this uh, this amazing job? So um, uh, like, I, I would say a, a handful of jobs I've had in, in the past. I knew somebody initially that was involved with the show um, who, where I got in the room with an interview. You know, mm -hmm. my agent also gets me in the room on projects I don't know anybody on, but this one happened to have somebody who I'd worked with on previous jobs. Now I still had to get the job, um, but that was an opportunity where I was brought in to interview because of that. Mm -hmm. um, and and she's one of the producers on the show, and um, and I think that I showed a strong lookbook. Uh, you know, I spoke about the project at the time when I interviewed. There were two episodes written. Um, they've changed a bit since we w w w in terms of shooting, but um, you know the 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 bones were there, and uh, and I had not read the book um, before going into the interview, mm -hmm. and I actually didn't read the book until I finished the show because I kind of, you know, sometimes writers tend to change things to work better on screen. And I just decided, you know, I have these two scripts, let's read this and do it like I would do any mm -hmm. other interview, you know? So I basically read it like that. Um, and uh, and I guess the interview went well. <laughs> now, I didn't know, you know, I knew that there was, it, there were going to be two DPs uh, at the time of the interview, I didn't know they had not hired another one. And I also didn't know if I was the first one or the second one. Um, it turned out I was the second one. Um, and Zach Galler, who I think was on your show, um, he uh, and I don't didn't actually know each other. We knew a lot of people in common, um, but we didn't know each other initially. Um, but as soon as we started talking, like as soon as we were connected, we were on the same page about mm -hmm. everything. Uh, in fact, at some point, we even talked about some of the images from our lookbooks separately uh, in our interviews, and we shared a lot mm -hmm. of the same images. So that was kind of cool, you know. Um, also, this show was the first show I had worked with another DP. All my other shows were either 30 minute shows where, for some reason, producers think one cinematographer can do that. It's you always want the prep, and I'll, t I'll talk about that at some point if you want. Mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, and then I did an hour long show even where I was the only cinematographer. So this one was really great in that respect that we were sharing duties. Um, and from the beginning, we were talking about a look and we were, you know, as he was involving me in as much as, as he could. Um, and I really appreciated that because I've heard horror stories from some cinematographers where, the, you know, the ego gets in the way they don't get along. It was 
the opposite on this show. That's great. But only two episodes were written at the beginning. When, when you interviewed and got the job, I'm assuming everything was laid out, you know, at some point, you know, you didn't, you knew the contents of episodes one and two prior to shooting episodes three and four. And you, did you shoot in, in sequence for the most part or no? We, well, we shot uh, episodes in sequence, but obviously within those episodes, right. you know, it's a puzzle piece of how you shoot it. Um, but yeah, so Zach uh, and team were shooting one and two while I was prepping three and four. Um, so, you know, I would go down to set every so often and just kind of see how things were going. Um, you know, I would look at dailies here and there. Going back to what I initially, maybe I didn't talk about while we were recording, but um, the beauty of this show is that almost each each episode, each chapter is a chapter in Elizabeth Zott's life. Um, and because of that, there felt like there was a lot of visual freedom to do certain things to separate from one to episode three. Um, I think as a cinematographer, it's important because even if you're the only cinematographer, you could work with eight different directors. So you have to have a consistency. It has to feel like one show. And when you have multiple DPs, especially DPs that don't talk to each other, that's where it gets challenging, right? Mm -hmm. So I think there has to be, there had to be a consistent through line for lesson right there had to be a look and there was a look that zach and i talked about but then within that episode like for instance in episode three you know i mean i'll say spoilers should we say spoilers we can if you haven't watched you can just can't spoil the, the finale for me since i haven't watched it. i'm not gonna spoil the finale for you <laughs> no but you know um she she deals with a, a major death and then that creates a whole different tone tonality for episode three moving forward mm -hmm. so that felt and that was something that the directors and i discussed just as our own piece you know um it's a major place to step in by the way I, and you know having watched it i just watched four episodes you know in the past two days and um you know well i'm very curious i'll ask this but you know the the obviously the break from the end of episode two to the beginning of episode three is is it's huge i mean it's you know it's uh you know it's a massive sh sh shift in the whole show um i frankly didn't know it was coming but in retrospect i probably should have because there are some indications of what's you know gonna happen and some of the central themes of the show i think are revealed in the conversation the night before Four, which I think is actually really beautiful. Um, but um, I wanted to know of the lookbooks that you had, because I think this does have a very sort of specific, I want to call it a period look. You know, I think the period is, is, is established as much by the lighting, the composition, the art direction. It really is a very thoroughly done piece in that regard. But what were the things that you both had they were in, you know, like mutual inspirations. So you're like, oh yeah, I, that's that's the way I saw it too. Uh, I, specifically, I remember images of Revolutionary Road, um, and there were some compositions that we both shared, also from that movie, where she was like, and it, it kind of worked really well in episode three, where she's like framed within a frame. You know, there was a lot of that that uh, Deacon shot that right. That Deacon shot um, that um, just felt very appropriate for this show. Um, I'm blanking on some of the others mm -hmm. right now, but that was a specific one. Um, there was a beautiful shot where the door, the, her friend leaves the service because she's so upset about the last interaction they had and the door closes and you're seeing through the cross, the window. Of the, the, of the, I mean, there's, there's things like that, that, you know, they don't just happen by accident, right? Like these are thought out. And, you know, I think what that may be the mark of a, of a, of a, of a piece of work like this, that's, engaging and engrossing is you're just watching you're just in, enjoying yourself you're not deconstructing everything and and acknowledging the millions of decisions that are going on to make that the right shot and the right look right in the right moment um so kudos to you i was trying to take notes and of course i <laughs> look at my notes and i had all my notes were like um you know grief how do you shoot grief right. Right, like let me, that's a... let me let me talk on that for a second. So um, about two weeks before we were 
No, maybe not even two weeks before we were actually going to go in and shoot episode three and four. I happened to lose somebody pretty close to me and my family um, uh, and had to fly back to New York for a weekend for the funeral. And it was so crazy because I was literally prepping with the directors talking about the cemetery scene and the funeral. And now I'm actually at a funeral. I mean, it was literally art imitating life, mm -hmm. you know, or that's the saying um and so i guess my mindset was even more in that world at the time um not that it shifted it in any direction but it just felt very like wow mm -hmm. okay um then i'm gonna i, I want to go back to what we talked about with prep because for the first time i was able to sit with these directors bert and birdie were the directors of three and four so mm -hmm. it was two women and um we sat for three weeks and we went through Every scene, we talked about the shots. Um, you know, I'm a big proponent of homework. And, you know, if you get on set and things change, then at least you had something in your back pocket. Um, and so, and that's what we had. We definitely, like, things shifted here and there. But for the most part, we always had a plan. And we looked mm -hmm. at these locations. We looked at that church. And we looked at that door and spoke about, like, you know, as we're dollying with her, what if, you know, the door closes and then we look through that window? Like all of mm -hmm. that stuff was planned out ahead of time. Um, mm -hmm. Is it common to have that much time to prep and, and discuss and, and collaborate pr prior to shooting? I think on an hour long, three weeks is about enough. I, you know, sometimes mm -hmm. they give directors two weeks. Uh, for this show, I think they gave them three weeks, um, mm -hmm. which we used every minute of it, you know. Um, there was a lot of locations to do. And um, you know, the interesting thing, like you talked about how the story, like he gets killed in episode two, but then you come back to it at the beginning of episode three from the dog's perspective. So mm -hmm. there, we actually had to show up, up when they were shooting that scene, we had to show up at the end of the day and do the scene where we push in on the dog and the dog runs up the street. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of like we were there at the same time that you know team one left team two comes in right know, block two comes in um which i thought was kind of cool because it was like a crossover into the next well episode. i think it's an important continuity to have between yeah. teams also because you're not watching the finished piece so in terms of that sort of intense feeling that i get as an audience member can only be conveyed to you in so many, you know, in, in the script or in, I guess, being there for part of what is being shot for the, for the, for the end of episode two. Yeah. Um, and I was very surprised to see it pick up from the dog's perspective, which I think is really, it, it's kind of beautiful then to go and have the dog flashback to how they met and the moments after bringing in the ball so that when she opens the box of stuff and it's like her yeah. love affair, like the dog, she, I don't know if that's the moment she forgives the dog or connects again with the dog because she's obviously having problems. Um, I mean, her performance is something I want to talk about as well. But um, you had said, was there, I mean, obviously there are things about shooting a dog, dog, PO, dog level, dog POV, right? Everything's down, yeah. you know, at, at the on the ground. So you're not, you know, that must have been a challenge. There's also, was there an Einstein back to the future reference to that I'm not getting. Maybe if you tell me what it is. I'll... Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, there is. Um, we, uh, um, at some point, she needs to go to work at Hastings, but she has to leave the dog. Oh, I... So she builds yes. this contraption, and it was sort mm -hmm. of our like, like homage to Back to the Future and the Rube Goldberg, you know, sort mm -hmm. of device thing. And the directors and I talked about these very macro shots that it's like this to this to this connects the, the food and right. the dog just sitting there. Right, I love that. <laughs> By the way, I don't know how you you must have not had food in there. My dog would never <laughs> have sat there like that. This dog's just like, eh. Um, but the, so. dog, the dog was great. I mean, the dog was a little over a year old, which is still kind of puppy years. Uh, mm -hmm. so in some respect, it's it's amazing that the dog was as trained and focused as, as, as he was. I mean, he had a great mm -hmm. team, obviously. Um, uh, and we kind of, uh, it was very important. I mean, the whole thing at the beginning was um, a good challenge, but it was a challenge because we had to basically create visuals to 
you know, to play over voiceover for a dog. So, and then moving ahead in the episode, there's infants and then eventually there's toddlers in episode four. I mean, it had it all, you know, um, but the dog in particular, you know, we felt it was very important. It's a cast member of the show, um, especially at the beginning of the show, you know, episode one to mm -hmm. four, uh, 630 is in a lot of our show. Um, and in episode three, it has its origin story. So we felt it was very important to be on its level and be, you know, in its POV as much as we could. Um, mm -hmm. And we... We had a, uh, do you want me to talk about how I did that or technically? Yeah, please. No, I think it's, uh, I just, I'm thinking you had like a high hat or a handle. Like, or I'm sure it was a very sophisticated thing. I mean, I, there's always, there were moments where we could have done something like that, but we happened to have a remote head on our show uh, for the whole show that was, it's made by Ari. It's called an Ari 360 head and it's stabilized and it was brought brought on the show not for the dog reason it was just brought on because of we had a lot of we have a lot of moves in our show we combine shots to try and make you know a scene that has three or four shots one shot you know that was a big thing on our show um and so that head did its purpose for that we were able to move a lot without dolly track because of the stabilized head once we introduced the dog, if you underslung, undersling the remote head, you can get really low. And with the stabilization, you don't have any dolly track on the ground. So if we needed to move with the dog, number one, there's not a camera operator in front of the dog. It's just a camera. So the wrangler could be right next to the remote head. And then we could pull the dolly back with the dog. And the dog is just acting you know theoretically right? right i mean um there's there's uh we were able to really just move around and get on that le that exact level that we needed and that tool was um was amazing for that mm -hmm. reason and you know when we're outside and all that military work we did a lot of crane because we didn't have the luxury of rolling on the ground but we had to get close enough and low mm -hmm. enough so we did i kind of like that the dog was a conscientious objector I thought that was a nice detail. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, it was it was very important that we stayed within the dog's. Mm -hmm. And who did the, did we know who did the voice for the dog or should it, I wasn't trying to too hard to think about who it was, but is it somebody that we know? Yes, it is. Uh, he was on the office and it's blanking right now. Okay. But it'll come. All right. He's in the credits. He's a he's a director now as mm -hmm. well. Uh, yeah. Oh, that's OK. It's um, but. But we didn't know. We didn't know at the time. I mean, it was just we knew what the voiceover was. Mm -hmm. We worked with our script supervisor about, okay, it's this much time, so these are the shots. Mm -hmm. How would this play out? Right. Um, Which it must be hard, because there is no with someone reading off camera to try to you know just approximate the timing on the voiceover. Absolutely. No. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and there were some moments. Uh, there's a moment where she finds out that she's pregnant, or she almost does. She goes. She runs to the bathroom. And then when she comes back and the dog kind of gives this like look, you know, it's, I mean, it's amazing. It mm -hmm. really looks like, like very concerned for her. Um, and um, I mean, I, we could talk about the dog for another half an hour if you want to, but I want to, I mean, I did want to talk. Because this is cinematography. It is about this, but it's adjacent to it. Brie Larson's face, it's um, incredible to watch yeah. without really doing anything. Yeah. And then, you know, I mean, there is a lot of movement in the camera for the show. But then there's, of course, in episode three, there's a lot of stillness. This is what I'm saying. Like, how do you shoot grief? It's just, and you just watch and you're just, you're, you're bear witness to this thing, this heart. And she gives everything. Right. Um, you know, what do you do? Is it, you know, you're it and watch and let it. For sure. And, and um, yeah, you touched on a really great point. Number one, Brie Larson is an amazing actress and she brought a performance. I always thought she was amazing, but seeing her performance in this, I was just blown away, you know, and what she did in episode three and there's very little dialogue in episode three so a lot of her performance is here right 
Um, and it was a conscious decision. Number one, the lighting. Uh, uh, the show overall has a more naturalistic tone. I would say a little darker than what you would normally see on television. But I felt that I tried my best to create that tonality on sets, even outside, to shape the sunlight or the overcast skies as best I could. And then exactly what you just spoke about, with grief and sadness comes stillness. And uh, there's a lot of moments where she's just processing and sitting, and uh, her emotions are so important that why does the camera need to do anything crazy? Like, let's just be with her. Um, so there were moments where we would get into the scene with maybe a slight move, very subtle, and then we would just be with her. And it was all, all, all like I said in prep, we talked about all of that mm -hmm. stuff. It wasn't like, oh, we had this plan to move the camera and now we're seeing her balking. Now, I will say, I gave her a lot of room that if she did want to do something, I didn't have a lot of gear around her. You know, um, we tried to be as minimal as we could on set um to let her perform and let the actors in general but yeah episode three was a big one with her and with the processing of it all and so i felt like oh, yeah. that was the direction we had to go from a, a cinematography standpoint right and and you know compared to the there, there is such life and um the episode two is lighter than air in the sense they're falling in love and there's this energy and he does his jazz dance for the first time and they're you know teachers trying to teaching her how to swim i think in that one too is that i watched them all very quickly so but like there's there's so much life yeah. and then the, the just like the construction of the whole episode three is that stillness that absence of it before it starts to you know begin again which is again another thing, and I think in episode four, it really travels such a great distance in terms of, you know, life is surprise. I think is one of the thing they said, you know, that sort of foreshadowing conversation. But um, her pregnancy, the, the the different directions her life and her career are going to go. You see the gears start to spin and mesh and work again, and things start to kind of like, you know, it just it takes air. And I'm sure this is all designed, but like, what, what were your conversations about? Like, when in episode three, do we indicate that or or re release some of that energy? And then, or, yeah, and then into episode four, which is, you know, keeps it jumps a number of times, seven years into the future. I'm assuming it stays there, but I don't actually know because I haven't watched that episode five yet. <laughs> um, but it starts to really take on this new momentum. The first thing I, I want to touch on is um going back to grief and the very first after the dog runs away we've created this sort of montage of time um and, and to me i uh, a long time ago um i lost my father and i got the phone call and it was as if the world slowed down and almost stopped and um our uh, mindset was that when she gets the news at the very beginning, it's not in the edit and it makes sense. It's not in the edit, but we actually had the dog, like she goes to the door as if Calvin has just come home from his run. She opens the door and she just sees the dog. And then from there, she falls back into a chair. And then all of a sudden there are two policemen that appear. And then she does everything else that you see in that episode. She walks into yeah. a transitionary thing where she goes into a funeral uh, mausoleum. And then it takes you to where she's looking at the piece of paper. And so we, the directors and I really collaborated on how to have those transitions work with sound, with this slowness, with this like, where am I? what just happened to my world. And that was a big thing because then from there, we really do go into a lot more still compositions. Um, but it was like, it was like taking what you just said from episode two, where everything seems so lively and in love and then slowing that record player down, you know, and now we're still. And so then to, to what you just asked, I think probably towards the end of the episode, where the dog gives her the ball or where she talked to Harriet is where things start to, she finds like 
okay, I can do this. You know, like I'm pregnant. I have to move forward. I have to, I have to deal with my life and everything that I have to do, you know what I mean? Um, so, uh, I feel like that and that running at the end of the episode, I think is our, our message from her, like, you know, I'm, I'm going to move forward. Um, mm -hmm. and I, I hope we shot that in that way because I felt I, when I watch it, that's what I feel from her, like running with the dog and like, you know, I will always love him. Mm -hmm. He's always going to be my memory, but, um, what's next? I think her, what's it called? Erging. It's erging the rowing machine. Erging. Yeah. That to yeah. me, where it's like, yeah. she's, she's oh, into yeah. him, right? You know there's, there's that too, where you feel like that's actually, that's a really good point that I forgot about that. That montage sequence is probably the point where she, I, I forgot about that. That's the end of, at, in the end of three, that's mm -hmm. where she, made, she has determination. You yeah. Know? And, and it's also like tempo wise from an editing standpoint, it's where we change everything. Yeah. So that's, that's probably the beginning of it. And then the running at the end, it's all like a, a culmination. Mm -hmm. And then we go into the beginning of four where she's in the hospital, you know? Yeah. Is this, is this four start with the flash forward? On the uh, with her, or with starts, with not her yeah. daughter, by the way. Like, the, what a bizarre <laughs> fake out, I, like an elaborate scheme that you guys created. <laughs> yeah, I I think the whole you know they want to throw the audience off, and then they you want to tie in the TV studio yeah. um, producer. Um, the the first scene actually is those gentlemen in the hospital, and they're talking about. Um, you know, why do we have to be here? Kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. And then we got to the hospital. And uh, I think that was like a Norman Rockwell reference painting or something. Something the guys like drinking um, in, in the waiting room. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, something. I, I remember one of our producers talking about that. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, but I, 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 I think we also like once we get into the hospital room, you know, we we move into her part of the world and then we went handheld, which was not really a style of the show up until that point and doesn't really become a style of the show. But in that moment, the directors and I really felt like, you know, we wanted to be with her. We got real close, very shallow focus, you know, to feel the pain that she was going through. Um, mm -hmm. We used a, we used a pretty cool tool. Um, Roger Deakins created this on the Jesse James movie. It's, they call it now the Deaconizer. <laughs> And it's essentially, I know, it's, we were trying to think of what kind of device could we use where Calvin comes in. This is like our, you see him a little bit in episode three, but her vision of him that gets well, that in, the in and out of focus, that sort of the, like throbbing sort of, yeah, that's a, that was the deaconizer. That's the deaconizer. And it kind of has the elements of a, if you've ever heard of a swing shift lens, but this kind of did, instead of like changing the focus, it like did it around the edges. I mean, if, if you've seen Jesse James, you mm -hmm. know what it is. It just has this like ethereal dreamlike quality to it. And um, uh, we tried it out, we tested it and the directors loved it. And so we use that just for the Calvin moment to break from the handheld. And then we get back into our lessons look once she has the baby and everything. Right, and he's in, I mean, he's completely represented realistically beyond but she just got the free painkillers so it's you know that vision is to me was justified as this sort of you, of you know um what was that movie about the guy who had the stroke and and he could only uh speak through uh blinking what the heck was that called oh, there's a lot of that the diving bell and the butterfly oh yeah exactly. that would yes so they use so the, the swing shift lens i'm pretty sure and mm -hmm. we looked at that. That was actually a reference I showed them and um, other movies. Mm -hmm. And I thought that th that um, uh, Janusz did great things in that movie with sort of like how this man, you know, how his vision was and what he was seeing. But we just, like you said, I mean, the drugs, are, that's a funny comment, but it was more about this, like, this man is going to give her hope to get through this mm -hmm. uh, with all the other stuff that she's not a fan of in this hospital room. <laughs> This is, I believe she would have made her own anesthesia if she had known it was forty five dollars. Probably. Uh, so very, it's really well well drawn. Um, 
you know, I can't wait to watch the rest of it. I'll probably steal a couple episodes. It was, if, you know, I could probably do two tonight. So it'll be five and six. Uh, but the problem is I want to watch it with my wife. So I'd have to go back and rewatch. Uh, and we watched um, Station Eleven together. Is that what it was called? That was it, right? Because that was another based on a book. And I'm really glad I watched it first and then read the book because I think if I'd read the book first, and I know people who did, they were actually very disappointed. Oh. They felt very betrayed by the show. Um, and I felt like they were two almost completely individual, equally beautiful and different yes. works. Like they're similar, obviously they have similarities, they're the same story, but um, the what they did in the series is so... Was, was different and bold and and its own thing and the book is also really great it's just not the same thing i thought was, um so i don't know that show was fantastic it was a very beautiful show um and i did not know it was based on a book so that's good to know i liked i liked the fact that this yeah. show was based on a book i i know i said i didn't read it but you know it it creates an audience immediately like you know that people who love this book are going to watch our show and i i know that there were some storylines that they changed but for the most part they really were true to this book um especially mm -hmm. i've read it since and and i can see that um so you have read it since i have yeah yeah so i mean i will be reading it because you know this when it's something that's good powerful like this i do want to see the source material and i'm reading such a piece of trash right now that i can't wait to put it down I, I found i was doing some exercise i looked over at the bookcase and i see license renewed it's like a james bond book after ian fleming died and i was like oh interesting and it's horrible it's just it's just barely a book so i'll put it down and i'll get this uh instead because i think it'd be i'd love to it's a cheat to see the characters you know what i mean because i'll be i'll know more oh, things I than i probably should um it's a fast but, read too it's a pretty yeah. fast read um yeah it kind of moves like i think the show moves in this like entertaining thrilling way and and uh, the, the book does mm -hmm. the same oh it's great um I, look i said i gotta keep going for for longer but i'm going to be i'm going to try to keep it at is, is sort of at the Gordon Burkell length, I think. Um, I, I really appreciate you giving us your time. We do have to ask you our, you know, our question, which is your guilty pleasure go-to movie or series that you watched. If it's on, you can't turn it off. What's the, you know, it can still be good, even if it's a guilty pleasure. Yeah. See, I actually don't, I, I'm, I'm going to cop out on this answer. I don't, I, my wife does. And she, sometimes we, you know, she'll have the TV on while I'm in the room and she watches all those reality things and stuff. I don't really have a guilty pleasure. I am watching Fargo right now and I love that show. And mm -hmm. I've watched every season. And to me, like where, hopefully we did this with lessons also, but where our television is, has gone in terms of like what some of these episodes look like uh, and feel like in terms of, a movie i mean i i look at our show and i'm like man, you know i'm very proud of it and i really do feel like there's elements that feel like a movie in it and i look at fargo the same way i'm just blown mm -hmm. away at the photography and everything involved well awesome. there are things that i like about revolutionary road but i actually like this show i i feel more drawn into this show than that film i know it was just one of many influences but um it's the casting obviously you can't like you know that that's just like a chemical reaction you can only try so hard to create and it's so powerful here it's just everyone's amazing i'll say um, i'll say this about lookbooks like because it's so hard you're so early in the process with a lookbook so you choose images to try and get a job right and and um, hopefully you're on the same page with the producers, number one, but then you get the job and then there's so much more that goes into it when you talk about the tone and where things go. And I think, you know, Revolutionary Road and some of these other images we looked at, like, you know, it's, it's a jumping off mm -hmm. point, you know, I think. And then it becomes like we talked about very early on in our conversation, it's this collaboration with all our, our keys, you know, our production designer, uh, Kat Smith is her name. She designed a world that, you know, I mean, yes, there's a lot that goes into the cinematography, but she, without an amazing production designer, there's, you only have half the job, you mm -hmm. know, and the costumes, you know, are, are just 
breathtaking. So all of those elements then create this palette. You know, we create a lot, you know, and they're all working together. If it's, if there's success to a show, it's because in my opinion, it's all of the elements are working as one. And um, so, yeah, so I think, you know, thank you for saying that. Uh, I look at Revolutionary Road and I don't necessarily, I'm like, oh yeah, our show is that, but it was a nice jumping off, mm -hmm. you know? Right. No, it's great. And I, it's, like I said, I just felt there's, a, there's an intimacy here, a, a, a courage to get right there like you're saying handheld like i want to be in the experience and i think um you know that sometimes for 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 formalist style sake you stay farther away from experience and it may be more artful but it's also more antiseptic um and i'm not even saying that about revolutionary road i'm just saying i really appreciate the proximity to the story that you guys have provided um and i think it does it a, gr a great service so um, I can't wait to keep watching. Um, we'll do another one of these when I'm done. <laughs> yes, we have to. We, we're we have a two parter. Science, Jason, I thought this, this, and this of the last four episodes. I can't wait to watch them, but um, I will, you know what? Well, if you want to, I'll leave the option open, but maybe yeah, I'll just get a message to you like, wow, amazing choice. Or wow, what a horrible ending. You blew it. You, you didn't stick the landing. <laughs> Uh, no, I'm sure you guys did great. Um, but I'll, I'll sign off for now saying that, that uh, we can you can check out FilmmakerU at FilmmakerU.com. Follow us on Instagram. I guess it's at FilmmakerU. Um, I get, uh, is there anything else that you'd like to say? Any parting words before we stop for the day? Um, I am just grateful that uh, you guys are taking the time to talk to me. I am very proud of this show and I hope that uh, your audience takes a look at the show. Um, I think a, a lot of us did. We put our, you know, our all into it. So I hope it shows. It absolutely shows. Um, so thank you guys for your dedication. I can't wait to see more work from you in the future. I'm sure, it'll be equally impressive. Um, so with that, John, uh, Jason Oldak, I'm not mispronouncing your name. I'm Josh Apter. I'll mispronounce. I, I've never mispronounced my own. Um, we will see you all next time and have a wonderful weekend. And uh, thank you again so much for taking the time to talk thank to us. This video is made possible by our sponsors, AJA. We'd like to thank AJA for all their support and tell you to go to AJA.com for all your production and post-production needs.